you get your Bibles open to Joshua, chapter number 15. And then when you get to Joshua 15, go to Joshua 10. Because that's where we're going to be. <laughs> Joshua chapter 10, just before the message, we're going to sing a song. Uh, it's called Knowing You. Anyone ever heard this song? All right, it's a, it's a beautiful song. It's easy, the tune's easy, and the words are incredible. So uh, as we sing it, you'll catch on to the tune very, very quickly. But as we sing, I want you to pay attention to the words that you're singing. And if you've heard it before, Cassie, sing loud to help a brother out. Amen? All right, so let's sing this. This is what's evening. <laughs> This evening, Howard this morning found the Arctic setting uh, on the air conditioner. Uh, so from now on, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep the fan running without the air conditioner necessarily on. I'll keep that set at 70. And if I get warm, I'm just going to take my coat off. All right, 
That way y'all don't freeze that. This morning, Ron was sitting on his hands. <laughs> it was so cold in here. So we're going to try to keep a little more comfortable for you. If I get warmer, I'll just take my coat off. Let me go ahead and do that now because it's a little warm up here already. <laughs> All right, Joshua chapter 10. We've been studying now for 10 weeks now. We've been looking through the book of Joshua. And this evening, we're going to look at chapter number 10. Then next week, we're going to finish our study of the book of Joshua. We'll look at the last couple chapters. But we've been studying this book, and we've, we've seen a story about how Israel has conquered the promised land. And we've seen their journey is a journey of faith. How they started out by faith by crossing the Jordan River and how God delivered them through there. And they saw the mighty hand of God uh, very real and very evident in their crossing the Jordan River. And then we saw, of course, uh, how by faith they conquered Jericho. And how obviously by God's power, because all they did was march around the city a bunch of times and blow their horns... The wall came falling down, and God's power and God's, God's power and presence with them was very evident. And we've seen how God has been with them the entire time that they've been conquering the promised land. So today, as we continue looking at this incredible story, we're going to see the story of a day in history that is so incredible. The Bible says there has never been a day like it before or and they like it since that day. So look at your Bibles in Joshua chapter 10. Start reading verse number 1. <clears throat> the Bible says, Now it came to pass, when Adonai Zedek, the king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel were among them. Now remember last week, we saw how Israel was deceived by Gideon. Remember, Gideon came to them, and they had old clothes on. They had old moldy bread. They had old uh, broken wine bottles, and they, they lied to Israel and said, we're from a very far country. Make a league with us. And so Joshua did, and come to find out three days later that they were not very far away. They were just 25 miles away. And so Joshua, because he did not seek God, had made a league with these Canaanites who lived in Canaan, the Gibeonites, of course. And now Gibeon was a very big city, very large city, very powerful city in Canaan, but they feared God. So they tricked Israel to have protection from God's judgment from them. But there's other Canaanites in the land. There's other kings, and these other kings, they are just as aware of what Joshua is doing. They are just as aware of what happened to Ai and Jericho as Gideon was. And now they get word that, hey, not only did Joshua come in and he destroyed Ai, he destroyed Jericho. Now he's yoked up with Gibeon, and Gibeon's a very powerful city, a very powerful nation. So now all these kings get together, and they have to do something. Verse number two, that they feared greatly because Gideon was a great city. Well, the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hoham, king of Hebron, and unto Piram, king of Jarmoth, and unto Jachai, king of Lachish, and unto Debir, king of Elgon, saying, Come up unto me and help me that we may smite Gideon. For it made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. So, these five kings get together. And they decide the only thing they can do is attack Gibeon. So they all come together and they attack Gibeon. Well, who just made a commitment to Gibeon to protect them? Joshua and Israel. So now all these five kings are attacking Gibeon. And Joshua, because of his, 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 his uh, league with them, he's going to act. So verse number five. Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem and the king of Hebron, the king of Jamal, the king of Lachish, king of Elgon, they gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gideon and made war against it. And the men of Gideon sent unto Joshua to the camp of Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. Now, real quick, before we go any further, how far is Gilgal to Gibeon? Remember? 25 miles. 25 miles. So Joshua and Israel go 25 miles in a very quick amount of time. Look at verse number 8. And the Lord said unto Joshua, at verse number 7, and sent it from Gilgal, he and all the people who bore with him, and all the mighty men of valor. 
And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not, there shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. Twenty-five miles in one night. That's a, that's a long way to go and a fast time to get there. They had a very brief amount of time and they traveled all night long. So they get there all night long. They kind of surprise them. The Amorites are surprised because he shouldn't be there right now. I mean, they knew he was coming, but he shouldn't be there at this time. So they're surprised. And for uh, verse number 10, And the Lord disconfitted them before Israel. And so that's a good way of saying God hurt them and killed them. Uh, and before Israel, and slew them with a great slaughter in Gibeon, and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Heron, and smote them to Achan and to Mecca. And it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel, and were the going down up to Beth Heron, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Ascal. All some papers there. <clears throat> Uh, and they died, they, and they died. There were more which died with hailstones, and they whom the children of Israel slew with a sword. So they chase them, they get up there, they go all night long, they get there uh, early in the morning, and they start attacking uh, these Amorites, and it's a great battle. The Amorites, of course, are running from them, and of course, Joshua and Israel, man, they're tired. They've been traveling all night long, so they're running before Joshua, and Joshua, they're trying to keep up, and they can't, and so God sends hailstones to destroy them, and so now a hailstorm is falling, and God is killing more Amorites with hailstones than Joshua killed uh, with the sword. Then verse number 12, then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and said in the sight of, the, in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon. And now moon in the valley of Jalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. It is, not, is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened in the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel." So the battle's going pretty well, but the Gibeonites are fleeing, or the, uh, the Amorites are fleeing in front of Joshua. So God sends some hailstones to kill a whole bunch of them, but it's still not enough. So Joshua goes to God and says, God, can you make the sun stop until we get the job done? And God does it. The Bible says the sun stayed where it was for an entire day. So Joshua and Israel could finish a job that God has given. And the Bible says that there has never been a day like that since in the history of all the world. So we're going to have a word of prayer. Get to our message this, this evening. It's simply entitled, A Day to Remember. Heavenly Father, thank you Lord for the day you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege that we have to gather together this evening and to worship you freely and openly. God, I do pray that as we open up your word and we study the book of Joshua, that God, you would speak to our hearts, that God, you would do a work in our lives, and Lord, help us to see from this story, this incredible story, some incredible truths that you have for us this evening. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move to each and every chair. I pray, God, that you would speak to each and every believer, do a work in each and every life. God, I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, speak through me this evening. God, help me to say what needs to be said, what should be said. And God, help me not to say what I should not say. But God, help everything that's said and done bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, it's important that we remember great victories in our life. When we have great success and we have great victories and God does a great work in our life, it's important that we remember these incredible victories. You know, as a nation, we have taken a day every year since... 1868 as Memorial Day to remember the men and women who have given their lives for our freedom and for our nation. And that's a day that we as a nation say we are going to remember what has been done for us. You know, Israel has many Memorial Days. They have many memorials spread out throughout the, the Promised Land. If you remember the story when they crossed the Jordan River in Joshua chapter 2? The first thing they did when they got across the river was they set up a memorial so that future generations could see that memorial. The Bible even says that they could see the memorial and ask, say, what is, those, what is that, that pillar over there? What is those rocks over there? What's that memorial over there? And the older generations could tell them the story about how God helped them, how God delivered them, how God was with them. It was also for the older generation. 
That when they would come upon difficult situations in their life, they could look back and say, you know what? God's been with me in the past. God will be with me in the future. And they could remember the incredible things that God did for them. So there have been some great days in our history, of course, that we should remember in American history. But today we're looking at the story of an incredible day in history that has never happened since. A day unlike any other in not just American history, but world history. In Joshua chapter 10, we see another conquest. Joshua and Israel, they are the nation, they're in the middle of a battle. They're in the middle of, of an incredible conquest, fighting the Amorite kings, fighting five kings at once. But there's a problem. They start, and it's, it's a pretty good problem to have. They start running out of time. They start running out of the time they need to finish the job that God has given them. They slipping by, and there's not enough time to finish the job. So Joshua goes to God, and the Bible says, in the presence of all of Israel. So all of Israel hears him pray this. He goes to God and says, God, stop the sun exactly where it's at so we can get this job done. And incredibly, God doesn't. God stops time right where it's at so Joshua can get the job. You know, this wasn't a quiet prayer to himself. This was a bold prayer in the entire presence of the, of the, of the, uh, of the Israelites and also of the army. And incredibly, God saw the importance of Joshua's request. And for the only time in history, I imagine God kind of pushed the pause button on the universe and said, all right, Joshua, take all the time you need. And the Bible says an entire day went by where the sun did not go down. The prayer that Joshua prayed, it took a lot of faith. But he had built up that faith by remembering what God had done for him in the past. By looking back and saying, God, you've delivered us from Egypt and you brought us through the Red Sea on dry ground. And God, you protected us in the wilderness. And for 40 years we wandered and, Lord, you fed us and you watered us and you clothed us and you, you took care of us, God. And, Lord, you helped us as we crossed the Jordan River. And, God, you defeated the, the Jericho by just breaking down the walls. And, God, you were with us at Ai. And, God, you have been with us all these times. And, God, your power is incredible and you've done so much for us. Oh, God... I'm pretty sure you can do this as well. And he remembered what God had done for him, and he remembered God's greatness, and that's how he had the faith to ask that. So I have to ask myself, do I have that much faith? Do I have the faith to go to God during difficult times, during times I need him and say, God, I've, I've got something that is so big that, Lord... I don't even know if it will be done or can be done. But God, I look back at my life and see how you've done other big things for me, God. And Lord, you've taken care of and you've provided for me, God. So Lord, you've done the past. And Lord, I know you can do it today. Do I have the faith that remembers the greatness of God? So tonight we have to ask ourselves a question. Does your faith limit what God is able to do for you? You know, God can do anything. We see here, God stopped the sun for a day. So God can take care of your problem. God can fix your need. God can heal your broken heart. God can heal your, your sickness. There's nothing God can't do. But God is limited by what I believe he can do. By the faith I have in him. The God we serve today is the same God that Joshua served. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20, it says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. God is able to do anything we need him to do. To heal any sickness. To fix any situation. God is able to do above and beyond. You know what? I love that verse. It says above and beyond not just what we ask, but what we think. You know, I bet Joshua, when he prayed that prayer, he probably uttered those words and thought, man, what am I praying I'm asking God to stop time. That's never happened before. Yeah, he's fed us from, from him with manna. Yeah, he's, he's helped us cross the Red Sea and helped us cross the Jordan River. Man, I'm asking him to stop time for a while. And, but he was able to do above and beyond anything that Joshua asked of all. There has never been a time in my life or in your life where that verse has not been true. There's never been a time where God is not able to do a more than you need him to do. It's not an issue of how big God is. It's an issue of how big our faith is. 
Do we have faith that can stop time? Do we have faith that can ask God to do incredible, big things? You know, we miss the blessings of God because oftentimes I think we underestimate God's ability and we pray small prayers. We pray prayers that can easily be answered. So it doesn't, doesn't stretch God. It doesn't, you know, God, it doesn't really, Joshua didn't stretch God either. But, you know, we, we pray prayers that are, that are easily answered. That me or you could probably take care of it on our own. So we don't stretch our faith. And so we miss the incredible blessings of God because we pray small prayers. In the Bible, we see men and women that prayed incredible prayers and saw God work in incredible ways in their life. And God has not changed. God has not gotten smaller. God's power has not diminished. The God that stopped the sun for Joshua is the same God that we serve, and he can still do it. So it's not an issue of his power or his ability. It's an issue of our faith. Many of us, we really don't believe that God is able to move and to work in the circumstances of our life. Or maybe we believe he's able to. We just don't think he will. Why would he get involved in my life? Why would he help in my situation? Why would he help in this problem in my life? Why? Because God loves us. Just like he loved Joshua. Just like he took care of them in the Bible, God can do the same things for us. So as we see in the story, in the story of Joshua, we see that there is nothing that we cannot do if we know that God is with us. So let's ask ourselves some questions tonight to see if we have the faith that causes us to remember the goodness of God in our times to help us trust Him. So the first question we want to ask ourselves is what is your response to trouble? When trouble comes to you, because it's, it's going to come. It may not be there now, but it's coming. And you've probably gone through some. So when trouble comes to our life, what is our response? You know, Gibeon was facing a pretty difficult situation in this story. Five kings are coming against him. Yes, Gibeon, the Bible says, is a big city. It's bigger than Ai, and all the men are mighty men of valor. So they have a big army. They have a large military. They, they have mighty men to help fight them and help defend them. But they've got five nations attacking them. There's no way they can survive that. There's no way they can get through that. Then, of course, the kings, they were the five kings, they were facing a difficult, difficult situation because of Israel's league with Gibeon. They knew what Israel was going to do. They knew the plan that God had given them to destroy every Canaanite in the land. And now, here Gibeon has made a league with them. And so now this powerful nation with a powerful God behind them, now they have another powerful nation in league with them. So they're scared. They don't know what they're going to do. So they're in trouble. Let's see how they responded these times. Both these groups are scared. Gibeon is scared of the five kings because they're being attacked. The five kings, of course, they're scared of Israel and Gibeon's lead them to meet together. But how do they respond? Well, the kings, we see in verse number five, the kings attacked. <clears throat> Look at verse five, and it says, And when all these kings were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Meron to fight against Israel. I think that's verse number 11. I'm, that's chapter 11. It's still five, though. <clears throat> number five. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the kings of Jeremoth, the king of Lachish, the king of Elgon, gathered themselves together and went up they and all their host and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. They were scared and they allowed their fear to cause them to attack Gibeon. Now, Gibeon was scared as well. Last week we saw they were scared and their, their fear caused them to make a league to lie, to deceive Israel. So Gibeon was scared last week, now the five kings are scared, and their fear causes them to be attacked. You know, we live in a day and age where the things of God are constantly under attack. You as a Christian, if you try to stand for God and try to walk with God, guess what? You're going to be attacked. You're going to be ridiculed and mocked, and we will be attacked because people, people will attack us because they fear God now, they don't understand it. They don't understand what we're doing, and so they attack the things of God. That's how the world responds to fear. But God doesn't want us to be afraid because of fear, and God doesn't want fear to drive us. You know, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 144 times in the Bible we are commanded to fear not. 
Fear causes us to do stupid things. Fear causes us to sin. And God says, I did not give you the spirit of fear. You know, I am, I am scared of snakes. I'm not as scared as I used to be. I mean, I used to be, if I saw a snake, I don't care how big it was, I was, out, I was as far away from that thing as I possibly could be. I hate snakes. They're just, they're not natural. They should have legs, you know? But they don't, so I'm scared of them. I remember one time we were in, uh, I was uh, working in construction. We were building a school way down past Appomattox, and it was during the summertime, and there was a bunch of guys there, and we had to wear hard hats. Some jobs we had to wear hard hats, some jobs we didn't, and we had to wear hard hats in this job, and I was paying in duct work. I was installing the HVAC system, and I'm just working along one day, and I'm on a six-foot ladder, about the top of the six-foot ladder where you're not, you know, the, the step that says not a step. I was on that. And so I'm up there, and I'm just hanging some duct work. All of a sudden, uh, another guy comes in. He's a friend of mine. He goes, hey, Sean, I got something for you. And I look at him, and he has in his hand the little, little black snake you've ever seen. I mean, it was tiny, but it was a snake. I came off that ladder. Well, I don't think I even stepped. I just jumped off the ladder and hit the ground running. I ran, and he's chasing me with this little itty-bitty snake. And I ran through a window, and the window, the frame had been put in, but the, the window had not. So I jumped through the window to get away and banged my head on that window sill and knocked my full self out because I was scared of a stupid snake. Fear causes us to do dumb things. And God says when we are attacked and we are facing difficult situations, we should not allow fear to control us. The Amorites allowed fear to control them and they attacked Gideon because of it. When fear comes, because it will, we do not respond by attacking, but we should respond like Gideon did. God, let's see how Gideon responded. Gideon called for help. Verse number 6. And the men of Gideon sent unto Joshua to the camp in Gilgal, saying, Slack not thine hands from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. When trouble comes to our life, our response should not be to attack or to run in fear. Our response should be to call for help. Now, give me, and they call for help from Joshua. Of course, when we have fear, our call to help should be to God. Our first response should be to go to God and say, God, I need help. You know, it's okay to say that. It's okay, you know, sometimes I think in our society, especially our culture, we don't like asking for help. You know, somebody asks us for help and we're, our pride uh, keeps us from doing it. You know, if they say men don't like asking for directions, I'm not like that. I will ask for directions in Walmart if I have to. Amen. You know, I just go to anybody. You got a blue vest on. You may not even work there. You got a blue shirt on. I'm asking you where the deodorant is because you people in Walmart don't put it where it belongs. So I don't mind asking for help. But, you know, there are some things I don't like asking for help about. You know, if I'm, if I'm working on a car and I don't ask you for help, I don't want it. And I'm probably not going to ask for help. I will go to Google. I will look at YouTube, but I want to ask for help. Why? Because of pride. I want to make sure I do it. And when we get into trouble, many times we don't like asking for help. But God says our response should be to go to him in prayer and say, God, I need help. There are so many things that we cannot control. You can't control most of the time your job. You could go to work tomorrow and your company be, be going out of business if you get laid off. You know what you can't control? You can control a limit about, but you can't control your health. You can be as healthy as you want and go to the doctor and, and get a report that you got cancer, you got some other disease. You know, when I was in high school, we had an algebra teacher. He was a Marine. Of course, he was retired, but darn it, retired Marines are just Marines that aren't active right now. So he was a Marine. And he was, I mean, he was a little guy. He was only about five foot ten, but he was in great shape. He rode his bike, he ran uh, triathlons. He was in incredible shape. He was only in his mid 40s. And my junior year, his mid-40s in great shape, he dropped dead of a heart attack. He couldn't control that. You can't control the things that come your way. But you can control your response to it. You can control what it allows to happen to you. We can, we can control our response to the trouble. There are times when we are facing trouble and we need to rely on God and to trust Him to help us in time of trouble. The kings attacked because of their fear, because of their trouble, but Gideon, they sought help when they needed trouble. Let's see what happened. Now, of course, they go to Joshua. Let's see how Joshua responded. First thing, second question we need to ask ourselves if you're asked to serve God or if you're asked to get involved, would you? 
Now, Joshua, of course, he just made this leap with Gibeon. And now Gibeon says, hey, Joshua, we know we just lied to you. We know you only found out three days ago that we're not who we say we are. And you're kind of mad at us right now. But hey, Joshua, guess what? We need your help. And so Joshua is asked to help. If God called you to work for him, to follow him, to work for him, would you be willing to do whatever it takes to serve God? Put yourselves in Joshua's shoes. He's upset with Gideon. They have tricked him. And then here comes someone calling him saying, hey, Joshua, we know you don't like us. We know you're mad at us, but we need your help. How would you respond? Not if someone you like, and not if your loved one comes to you and says you need help. That person that irritates you. That person that gets on your nerves. That person that you don't think deserves help. They come to you seeking your help, and God lays on your heart and says, this is me. Like I said this morning, this is God trying to get involved in your life. How would you respond? Well, let's see how Joshua responded. First thing we notice is his response was immediate. Verse number 7, so Joshua ascended to Gilgal. From Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. You know, Joshua, when the word came, he didn't tell the Gibeonites that came to him. He says, well, you go back and tell Gibeon that we'll be there when we can. You know, we're tired. We've just marched a long way. We've just defeated AI. We're, we're, we're pretty mad at you guys right now anyway. So, you know, we'll, we'll break camp in the morning. We'll get a good night's rest. We'll get up in the morning and have some breakfast. No bacon. But we'll get up and have some breakfast. And then when we have time, we'll get your way. No, he stopped what he was doing immediately. And every one of them dropped what they were doing. They didn't stop and rest. They didn't get a good night's sleep. They didn't wait till morning. They immediately obeyed the command. They immediately obeyed the call to go and help. They marched all night long, ignoring their need for sleep because it wasn't about him. It wasn't about his men. It was about fulfilling the purpose that God had for him and had for Israel. Now, we said already, the march took that was a 25-mile march, but the march was up a 4,000-foot incline. They're marching uphill 25 miles. Anybody walked uphill for a long time? Makes you tired, don't it? You know, go hiking up the, the peaks of otter. It, it takes a long time to get you get up to the top, you know, you're tired. You're exhausted. And it's not 25 miles, it's a long way. But they marched 25 miles of a 4,000 foot incline all night long. The march should have taken them three days. It took them eight hours. They were humping it, running up that hill. They were running up that hill to help the Gibeonites. When they get there, they're tired. They haven't slept. They marched uphill for 25 miles at a very rapid pace. And they get there, and guess what they got to do? Fight five armies. They are extremely tired and exhausted. Gibeon really interfered with Israel's plans. But their response was immediate. They didn't care about themselves. They didn't care about their needs. They only cared about serving and obeying the God's command on their life. He put all that behind him and he responded immediately. The second thing we noticed about his response was that God gave him the courage that he needed. Look at verse number 8. And the Lord said to Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thy hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Despite their fatigue, God tells Joshua, says, Joshua, when you get there to fight them, none of your men are going to be hurt. That's a pretty big promise. Because remember, Joshua, he's the general. He's a leader. He cares about his men. And he's thinking, man, I've just marched them 25 miles uphill all night long. They're exhausted. Now we've got to go fight armies and men. Some of them may die. We may lose some men tonight. They may have to go back to Israel and say, I'm sorry, but several of you wives, you lost your husband. Some of you kids, you lost your daddies. But Joshua gets there and God says, Joshua, don't worry. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to do this through you. None of your men are going to die. Over and over again, the Bible, the Bible reminds us that God is with us wherever we go and whatever we face. No matter what we're facing, God says, I'm right there with you. Look in Psalms, uh, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 31. The Bible says the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. We will have trouble in our life. We will have difficulties in our life. We may face battles in our life, but God says he is there with us. Psalms chapter 20, verse 7. 
It says some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. You know, we're not to trust in our might or our ability. That's what he's talking about. You know, Joshua wasn't trusting his ability to fight, his ability to do war against Gibeon or against Amorites. He was trusting in God's ability to take care of him. And that's what we're supposed to trust in, not our ability, not our strength, not what we can do, but what God will do for us. In the second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 7, we see Hezekiah, king of Israel. He's facing a similar situation. He's facing a dire situation right here. He's got the Philistine army. They are coming against him, and they are about to defeat him. They're about to destroy him, and Israel's looking out, and they're scared because they see the size of the army, and they think, man, this is the end, but Hezekiah encourages them. In chapter 32, verse 7, he says, Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, nor dismayed to the king of Assyria, nor for all a multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. Now that statement was not true, physically speaking. The king of Assyria had more men than Israel had, but Hezekiah knew that God was with them. It says, With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord. Our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. The same is true for us today. No matter what we are facing, no matter what battle we come against, when we face spiritual battles, God is there to help deliver us, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to help us in the battles that we face. Whenever we fight against, God is on your side fighting for you. So we have to ask the third question of ourselves. We've already seen what's our response. We've already asked if God did ask us to, to act, would we? Second, third question we've got to ask. As God does move in your life, who gets the glory? Who gets the glory for what God's going to do in your life? Look at verse number 10. It says, And the Lord disconfitted them before Israel and slew them with the great slaughter of Gideon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Hebron and smote them to Agath and to Machida. And it came to pass as they fled before Israel and were in the going down of Beth Huron, uh, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them to Azekiah, and they died. And there were more that died with hailstones, and whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Jonathan to the Lord the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand now still upon Gibeon and the moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, the people. And the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. So we see this incredible story that happens in this incredible battle. But we got to understand in all of it, we see it time and time again. Joshua didn't do anything. God killed them. The Bible says God disconfitted them in the battle. God was the one that chased them. It doesn't say they ran from Joshua. They ran from God. God chased them from the battlefield that day. Then who was the one that threw the hailstones down? It was God. Joshua wasn't throwing snowballs. God was raining hailstones from heaven to destroy them. Then who stopped the sun? Was it Joshua? It was God. God stopped the sun. In this incredible story, we see an incredible battle. We see an incredible victory. But all throughout it, we see God did it. God was the one that fought. God was the one that moved. The same is true in your life. You know, God may use you to do something. God may use you to be a blessing to someone. God may use you to, to, to answer a prayer for someone, or God may move in your life, and he may give you wisdom to help a problem in your life. But whatever happens in your life, whatever situation we face, when God delivers us, it's not because of us. It's not because of our abilities. It's because of God. So when God moves, who gets the glory? There should be no question who is in control of the circumstances of your life. God did the work through Joshua and through Israel. You know, we've all been beaten up by the enemy. And if it were not for God, Satan would have destroyed every single one of us long ago. But God and his merciful hand, if you're honest, can be seen throughout your entire life. Looking back at my life, <coughs> I can see God's mercy and grace in my life very evident and very clear. And I can look back and say, well, it was because I did this or I made a good decision here or I made a right decision there. But if, you're, if we're honest with ourselves and say, God... Everything that's happened to me or happened that's been done to me has been because of, because of your grace and your mercy. Let's see how Joshua, how God worked through Joshua. First, we see that the Lord chased the enemy. We get in verse 10. Joshua didn't chase them. God chased them. God was the one who chased them off the field. Second, we see is the Lord rained down the judgment. 
You know, I kind of imagine that as the people are running away, God looks at it and he starts passing out snowballs in heaven. So, all right, angels, have fun. Can you imagine as the Israelites? Here you are, you've, you've run all night long, and now that when they're chasing the Amorites from Gibeon, they're running downhill. So now the Amorites are running downhill and you're chasing them. Imagine yourself, you're an Israelite soldier. You're running as fast as you can. You finally catch up to an Amorite. You're about to spear him, and all of a sudden the hailstone just takes him out. Just poof, you're like, oh, okay, whatever mind. But hang back and let God do this thing. You know, the, and I read this read while studying this. The largest recorded hailstone on record that has ever been captured in the U.S., uh, it fell on July 23rd, 2010, near Vivian, South Dakota. It was eight inches in diameter. It had an 18 and a half inch circumference, and it weighed 1.9375 pounds. That's a big hailstone. They say as it fell, it reached it reached speeds over 115 miles an hour. When that thing hits, it does some damage. That's what was coming down on the Amorites. These huge hailstones at supersonic speeds were just destroying them, and God was the one that did it. But we also see that it was the Lord that answered Joshua's prayer. It was God that answers Joshua's prayer, and it is God that tells us to, to hear that hears us today. When we pray, just as Joshua prayed, no matter how big our prayer is in, when we when Joshua prayed, God heard him and God listened to him. Can you imagine that? I still I can never wrap my brains around this, but the creator of the universe, when I pray to him, when I cast my care upon him, when I come and say, God, I need help, he listens to me. He hears me, and he gets involved. You know, I don't understand these religions that believe that God's up in heaven and just kind of watches us and he doesn't get involved. I serve a God, according to my Bible, which is the truth, that says God hears my prayers and answers my prayers. Amen. The God that heard Joshua is the same God that hears us today. And he hears our prayers. That's an incredible promise that God gives us. And that promise should strengthen our faith, our faith in the battles that we face. Knowing God will work through us, that knowing God will fight for us, knowing God will hear our prayers should strengthen our faith and encourage us to continue on. Let's ask the fourth question. <coughs> and this is probably the most important one. Number four. How's your prayer life? Not just during the times of trouble. Because let's, let's be real honest. Most of us, when trouble comes, man, we are prayer warriors. We go to work and the boss says we got layoffs coming off and coming up, and you may be it. You know what we do? We, start, we call everybody. Man, we need to pray, brother. We need to pray, preacher. Man, we are prayer warriors until that battle's over. Then what do most of us do? You forget to pray. Yeah, we pray in over a meal, God. Thank you for our meal. You know, I was reading a story the other day about this guy. This guy, he was coming out of the Best Buy. And he said he just bought an iPad. And he was leaving the Best Buy, and he looked down, and he saw a homeless guy at the trash can. And he was picking, uh, like, food from the garbage can. And he had one little area, but he had one little bag beside him. And as he was picking out garbage bags, he'd get a little piece of a burger. He'd put it to the side, and he'd get some fries in the bottom of the bag, and he'd put it to the side. And the guy was watching that, and he, just, he said he felt, he felt burned to do something. So he said he went to a McDonald's that was right around the corner, and he bought the guy a meal and brought it back and, you know, gave it to the guy and sat there talking to him for a while. And he said the guy was just so very thankful and just thanked him profusely and, you know, was very grateful for what he did. And so he said he just gave him a meal, talked to him for a while, and he left. But he said he got a few, few blocks away, and the Lord laid on his heart to go do something more. So he said he went back, and he found this guy riding his bike, and he told him, he goes, hey, can, can I buy you uh, another meal, maybe get you through the night? And can I get you some gift cards so you can have some meals for the rest of the week, maybe, and just do something for you? And the guy said, he, and the, the, the man that's telling the story said, the homeless man broke down and started crying. I said, I prayed for you today. And he said, he, the guy said, well, I thought he meant since I brought him a meal, he prayed for me and thanked God for me. And he said, what do you mean? He said, when I woke up this morning, I prayed that God would send somebody to help me buy a hot meal. You ever prayed for a hot meal? That God would give you one? I have. But we don't pray like that. Why? Because we're not in situations. So we pray for a meal. God thanks for the food. Amen. And we eat. But how is our prayer life during times of distress, during times of trouble, but also 
when things are going well. The prayer that Joshua gives is a huge prayer. And it took huge faith to ask of God. How can he pray like that? How can we pray like that? Well, first of all, <clears throat> we can pray like that because we know by faith God is able. Verse 12 says, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day of when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel and said in the sight of, in the sight of, the, of Israel, Sun, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of, of Ajalon. You know, this is an incredible prayer that Joshua prays. Now, during this time, they had no idea about the earth going around the sun and the universe and the, the solar system and rotation and all this stuff and, and gravitational pull. They had no idea about this. But it is still an incredible prayer. Have you ever wondered what would happen if the world did stop? If the world just all of a sudden got put on the brakes and the world stopped spinning so the sun could stand still, what would happen? Well, i got a video to show you real quick. It's about too many videos. Let's see what would happen if, if this happened, if, if Joshua's prayer were answered by God. With it, we are all spinning with the earth, and that is why slamming on a set of magical planetary brakes that cause everything classically called earth to stop spinning would be catastrophic. Immediately, everything that wasn't Earth and wasn't safely at the poles would continue moving as it had been and be flung due east at more than a thousand miles an hour. You wouldn't be flung into space because escape velocity is 24,800 miles per hour, but your body would instantly become a 9.5 inch caliber bullet. Well, really more of a supersonic tumbleweed. Because the atmosphere would more gradually slow down, people in airplanes, assuming they could navigate the resulting storms, might have a better chance of surviving. Astronauts aboard the ISS would fare even better, but it is unlikely that anyone would be waiting for them down on the ground. Runways would just be entrances to the new planet-sized graveyard created by the no longer spinning Earth. People really, really near the poles might be okay, but only at first. Gusts of wind as fast as those near an atomic bomb detonation would blast past the surface and up into the sky, forming worldwide storms of unprecedented magnitude. The friction alone caused by the now-stopped Earth colliding with these winds would be enough to cause massive fires, unparalleled erosion, and damage to anything strong enough to stay put after the initial breaking. The sun would seem to freeze in the sky as days became not 24 hours long, but 365 days long. Without spinning innards, Earth's protective magnetic field would cease to exist, and we would be dosed with deadly amounts of ionizing radiation from the sun. The oceans would surge onto land in tsunamis kilometers high and wash over nearly all dry land before migrating to the poles where gravity is stronger, no longer held in the ocean basins by the inertia Earth's spin gave them, until Earth itself, no longer bulging an extra 42 kilometers around its equator because of its rotation, slowly compressed into a more perfect sphere than it is now, possibly allowing the oceans to eventually return somewhat. That is what would occur if it actually happened. It won't actually happen, but whoa, its rotation is slowing down. That's a pretty catastrophic event that Joshua is asking to happen here. Now, of course, he doesn't understand scientifically what's going to happen. So if the world stopped spinning instantly and all these things happened, and Joshua prayed it, did God allow this to happen? Now, the Bible says it did. Now, of course, we by faith, we know that if God can create everything, then certainly God can stop the rotation of the earth long enough and not allow these catastrophic events to happen. But what's interesting to know is historically, there are historical writings, from ancient writings from China, the Inca Indians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Aztecs, and the Mayans that all speak of a day that either never happened because sun was super, because the, uh, the night was super long, or an extra long day that seemed to never end. They weren't there in the battle, but they were somewhere in the world when God stopped the sun. If you're in Mexico and it's nighttime and God stopped the sun, guess what? It's nighttime for an entire day. 
And they thought the world was never going to come back. They, the, 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 the writings in Maya and the Inca Indians, they say that they thought the sun had disappeared forever and it would be eternal night. Because there was a super long day. Well, astronomers, they have an, astro an astro astrological history chart. They can, what they say, they can look at every day in the history of astronomy from when the Big Bang occurred all the way up to now. But every astronomical chart says that there's one day that's just missing. They can't explain where it went. They don't know what happened to it. They said there's just one day that never seemed to happen. What happened? God stopped the sun. And we see these things, and that's why so many people who are not of faith and don't have faith don't believe these things. Oh, it could never happen. Well, by faith, we know it can. By faith, we know that God is strong enough and God is able to do these things. But also by faith, we know that not only is God able to answer, by faith, we know God will answer. Verse number 14. And there is no day like it before or after it that the Lord hearkened to the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. What made this inc so incredible isn't God's ability to do this, but God's willingness to do this. What made it so incredible was God answered this incredible prayer that Joshua had. God can answer our incredible prayers as well. The difference between us and Joshua is we don't pray. We don't send up these prayers. Joshua believed that God loved him enough to intervene. Maybe we don't see God's power because we don't ask incredible prayers. Trusting only that only God can, but God also will answer our prayers. You can never ask God something that was too big for him to answer. You know, the same way that God answered Joshua, he's going to answer us and enable us to do more than we can possibly imagine or even I think we can do if we have the faith that God's going to do it. If God is big enough, if God is powerful enough to intervene in such an incredible way for Joshua, imagine what he can do for you today. We're not asking to stop time, but do we ask him to do anything? Do we ask God to intervene on our behalf? You know, we're all going to face trouble in life. When it comes, what's going to be your response to it? Will you trust God to deliver you as he has in the past, or you trust in your own strength? Will you limit God's ability by your faith or you ask God and trust him to do incredible things in and through you. Will you remember how good God has been in the past and allow that to strengthen you to trust God to do great works in the future? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day you've given us. <coughs> thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together this morning, this evening, Lord, and to worship you. Thank you, God, as we study your word, that we can see how you did incredible things in Joshua's life. And God, we're thankful for the story. We're thankful for what you 